Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, From the Deep End here on this, uh, what is it, September uh, 7th edition of the of the program. Glad to be with you this, this morning as we, um, well, both uh, start the day and uh, unfortunately wrap up the week because I'm going to be gone uh, tomorrow uh, for uh, uh, some uh, traveling that I have on, on tap. But um, we will uh, do the best we can to, to work through the, the day today and have a hopefully a good program today. Um, because I'm going to be gone tomorrow, uh, we have uh, with us this morning uh, on Wednesday instead of Thursday, we have my father Dan Jenkins is with us the, this morning, sir. Uh, how are you doing today? It, Dan, you- it, I am doing great. It's, it's just great to see people signing in and everything. You know, you've got a real following in on this, Jonathan. And- and I know why, because there's, a, there's some real spiritual food available, and people are are starving. So many are starving for good deep Bible study. Well, we try to do our best here to uh, facilitate that as we um, as we uh, consider the different uh, Bible topics that are on uh, on tap for today. Um, in uh, in this program, uh, we. Um, we tried to address your Bible questions. Um, and yesterday we had a really good discussion going on, Dad. I don't know if we'll get back to it tonight, today or not, um, but uh, ended up not actually getting to the second hour of the program where we uh, talked about the book of First Peter, at least uh, we have been lately. Um, but we were talking about the qualifications of elders and some other things along the way. And I don't know if the people want us to go back there today or not, but I, I did tell them to get the final answer. I knew where to go. So... Uh, if they bring it back up, you're on tap. So that, that that's what the uh, that, that, that's what we're going to be dealing with. But um, um, I just well, wish we, that were true, Jonathan. I wish it were true. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> and my voice is already trying to give out on me. So uh, I'm going to let you talk as much as you want to this morning, Dad. It is really um, really not good at the moment. Um, but uh, let's go ahead, if you will. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and being a part of the program. Uh, and what, what we do here uh, on uh, From the Deep End is we just take a few moments uh, each morning and answer your Bible questions. So uh, whatever we talk about is um, uh, largely controlled by you, by your input, by the things that you put into the comment section. So if you have any uh, any Bible questions, go ahead and uh, start putting those in and we'll address them as we, um, as we get opportunity. Man, my voice is already gone. So I'm going to go ahead and stop talking for just a minute here, Dad. Uh, and go ahead and get you the first question on tap and let you uh, start uh, uh, answering these questions for some people. So, um, and Paul asks about Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Um, and he says, especially um, the latter part of verse number 3 is what Paul has in mind. Um, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Um and that gets us right to the point about the uh, uh, the, the thousand year reign, the binding of Satan. Um, Satan is bound in a bottomless pit, and uh, with a great train, a great chain rather. Uh, he and he sees the dragon uh, that the angel does. In other words, that, eight, that that ancient serpent who is the devil, that is Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And then verse three says. And threw him into a pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that uh, he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. So um question is on those verses, particularly that um, the latter part of uh, verse number three. So uh, do you have any thoughts on those verses, sir? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, and it may really help your throat if you want me to just talk a little bit about it. The, uh, Go right ahead, because it, it just hit, it hit me right as, as we, just as we started. My, my throat there, is- there, there, are, there are four things to remember about the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 1, it's a revelation to seven churches in Asia in signs of things which must shortly happen. And you'll never understand this book until you come to the realization of the truth of that. In chapter 22, the very same thoughts are presented, not all of them. But the statement is, you know, that uh, uh, this is a revelation of things which must shortly happen. For the time is at hand. So that's the gist of the book. And I don't want to get uh, deeply into the book. 
Uh, Jonathan, I've got an echo. Does anybody else have it, or is that just me? Maybe if I turn my volume down, maybe that would be better. Okay, that may be better. That's that's a whole lot better. I had my volume all the way up, trying to see if you were getting on. There are four enemies in the book. Uh, you can talk all about the symbols and everything, but if you'll recognize there are four enemies in the book, there is the dragon introduced in chapter 12. In chapter 13, there is a beast that comes out of the sea and there is a beast that comes out of the land. The beast that comes out of the land is later called the false prophet. And then there is that woman called Babylon. And so when, when you get to chapter 19, there is the destruction of chapter 18 and 19, the destruction of three of those enemies. In chapter chapter 19, well, chapter 18, the great city, chapter 11, verse 7 says that Jerusalem is overthrown and the whole world rejoices because of that. They're dismayed. But they are, the whole world is aware of the destruction of that woman, Babylon. Chapter 11, verse 7 says that, that that great city, that's the way that woman is described in chapter 18, is where the Lord was crucified. Well, in chapter 19, the two beasts are destroyed. How? By the rider on the white horse, who is in the very beginning of the symbolic language of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter chapter 6, when the seals are open, which contain the future, there's a rider on the white horse. And now the statement is, when you get to chapter uh, 19, the rider on the white horse destroys two of those enemies. That is the beast of the sea and the beast of the land. How does it do it? Not in an atomic war Armageddon, but with the sword that comes out of his mouth. The word of God destroys two of those enemies. That only leaves the third one. And that is that dragon. Well, chapter 12 says that dragon is Satan. It is interesting to think about the impact Jesus had on the abilities of Satan. The Bible said, Hebrews chapter 2, you start in verse 14 and read about three verses, that Jesus, because the children have bodies of flesh and blood, Jesus took on himself the, a body of flesh and blood that through death, that's his death, he might destroy the one who had the power of death. Who's that? Well, it's Satan. And the next verse says, and deliver them who through fear of all, through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus came to destroy the devil. In chapter 12, it, where the dragon is introduced in this book, there's a child that is destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's the language of Psalms 2. And the book of Acts identifies the character in Psalms 2 as Jesus himself. The man-child is born and he ascends to heaven. When he ascends to heaven, Satan is cast out. He is described in that chapter as the, as the devil, the, uh, the old serpent. And he's then also is described as the accuser of our brethren is cast out. Well, what happens as you read this book? It's of things which must shortly happen. And so when Jesus ascended into heaven, Satan, Satan's power was ruined. In fact, when he, when he arrives on the earth, he is there seeking to, de to, de uh, to deceive the nations. And he does it because he has the allies. Of the, of the beast of the sea, the beast of the land, and especially the ally of that woman who is drunk with the blood of the saints. And so what happens to Satan? Well, this is a book about things which must shortly happen. It is significant that the Bible, in a book of things that must shortly happen, says here is what's going to happen, and it's going to cover 
a period for 1,000 years. Now, the question is, is that literal or figurative? It, uh, uh, you know, you, you probably would not know had you lived in 900 A.D. You know, when back in chapter 2, the Bible says to the church at, uh, was it Smyrna that he says it to, that uh, uh, he says, you will have tribulation 10 days. How many days would it take those individuals in Smyrna to know if that's literal or figurative? I'm confident by day 11, they would be able to understand it. Now then, is the word 1,000 ever used figuratively? Yes. Two places immediately come to mind in the book of Deuteronomy. It's even chapter 7, verse 9, or 9, verse 7, that says he's merciful to a thousand generations. Does that mean generation 1,001? He's not merciful? Uh, no, it's figurative in that very usage of it. In Psalms 50, I believe it's about verse 10, the Bible says the cattle, pardon the sheep of the, maybe it's the cattle of a thousand hills belong to the Lord. Maybe it's the sheep of the thousand hills belong to the Lord. Well, what about the sheep on the hill number 1001? It's figurative. And so here's a book in, in this book says, let me tell you what's going to happen to the dragon. He is going to be bound because he has destroyed the devil. The devil's power has been taken from him and he's bound with a chain for a thousand years. What's going to happen after the thousand years? Well, as you, as you, as you read this, do not overlook the fact that, that hell is described as a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 11, um, verse 10 it is, of Revelation chapter 20 says, And the devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I know what's going to happen after the thousand years. Now the question concerns the latter part of verse 3, and that is, um, it, it, after the thousand years are finished, the devil will be released uh, for a short time. And he must be released for, for a little while as the New King James. And that's it. And I think it is interesting to, uh, to note that there's nothing said about his power, uh, that, but he must be released for a little while and evidently released to try to accomplish what he did before. I do, the Bible does not state that. But if he is bound by the word of God for a thousand years, then he is released and he's no longer bound by that which he was once bound by. And whether that is a great time of use, trying to bring persecutions on Christians or just a time of great immorality and ungodliness. If, if it is the former, there is no indication. There is no indication of the, of the fact that, uh, 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 that those individuals would even be Christ, Christians would be aware of it. That is, is this going to happen? And so the Lord does not is, cannot say he's bound for a thousand years and then he's cast into the bottomless pit. He's going to be released. And I do not know much more than everything I've said. And when I get to that latter, latter part of verse three, I know that after the thousand years, I know that Satan will be released. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and during that time, souls that were under the altar back in chapter six saying, Lord, how long before you avenge our blood on them that are on this earth? Vengeance has been brought on all four of the enemies. They're told it's about to happen. It's going to happen in a short time. And, the, and, the, and that's exactly historically what happened. Jonathan, I read the other day that by 300 AD, 
there were 30 million New Testament Christians in the Roman world. Uh, no, re no reference is given, so you could substantiate it. And I don't know if that's just some scholar wanting to impress, but you stop and think about whenever, the Rome, whenever Jerusalem is destroyed and Rome, the beast that had empowered the woman, turns against the woman in chapter 19 and destroys her, the gospel goes, it just starts, it spreads and spreads and spreads and spreads and spreads. So, and, and so it was the spread of the gospel that caused Constantine to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman world. You're talking about conquering Rome from having all the gods of the Greeks that had been so much a part of the Roman culture. And now government saying the official religion of the world is Christianity. Christianity has conquered the world. I think we, and when I read that number 30 million, I thought that just cannot be, you know, if, if there, if there are a hundred million people in the Roman world, I, I looked that up and the number doesn't come up a hundred million, but if there were a hundred million, 30% of the world would have been Christian. And, and, uh, that, I was just amazed when I, well, when, when I, when I saw that number, what's revelation three, uh, 20 verse three said when the thousand years are, are finished, the devil will be released. Uh, and, and he must release for a short while. And then he says, but when the thousand years have expired, verse seven, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, uh, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They go, they went out to the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and destroyed them. There's a lot of, I don't knows. I can quote it, uh, but uh, for me to say more than the Bible says is foolish. And I believe that's what's going to happen. Uh, that's about all I've got to say about that. Unless you know what you think. Uh, no, let me, let me jump in here and just uh, echo what you said. I think a few minutes ago in that um, um, the, I think the important thing to note about the text is that uh, there is no indication in revelation chapter 20 that when, whatever this event of this little season where, wherein he is loose after the thousand years, he gathers the nations together to get, <clears throat> excuse me, gathers the nations together to uh, attack the camp of God, the people of God. But as you said, there right. is no indication that the attack ever occurs That's right. and or that the people of God are ever aware of it. Um, and, and I think that's, that's important is that the text never says that the attack ever actually happens. Um, and, and to me, that would be not just a passing note, but a very important note. Yes. Uh, yes. Otherwise, we could just sit and wait, and maybe there would be something very much different about the the world that we live in and the work of Satan. And uh, just prior to the return of Jesus, there would be a great battle with uh, with the uh, uh, Gog and Magog led 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 by Satan, and so on. And then you know, then we would obviously know the the, the time of the return of Jesus. Uh, Revelation chapter twenty does not allow, um, uh, or does not indicate rather that there's any um, awareness of that action on the, on the part of the people of God. So uh, as you said, I think that's a very, very important uh, portion of the, um, uh, of the, the uh, analysis of that text. Well, if that day and hour knows no man, if Christians were aware of it, we'd say, this is it. You know, the Satan is, is Satan is winning. He surrounded the camp of the saints. Satan is winning. He's come as a thief in the night. And he says, um, uh, Paul says of the times and seasons, not just the day and the hour, but the times and the seasons, you have no need that I should write to you. You know perfectly well, the Lord comes as a thief in the night. When they're saying peace and safety, then the Lord comes suddenly upon them as travail upon a woman with child. There are no signs to indicate when he's going to come back. And you're right in emphasizing this is no trivial matter. There's just nothing in the text to indicate that we will know that it has happened. 
Let's turn our attention to a question from Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan says, I saw a preacher on Twitter post this. He says, uh, uh, the, the, the post says, anxiety is sin. And then he goes on, Jonathan does, to say, fundamentally we become anxious because we've chosen to doubt God's grief and perfect will for our lives. Uh, then he gives a couple of references there, Matthew 6 and 1 Peter 5. Um, and Jonathan's question is simply, what do you say to this? Um, and I'm going to step out for a second, Dad. I forgot to fill up my cup this morning. Um, while you fill up their spiritual cup, my throat is really at, barking at me. I'm going to go fill up my physical cup. So I'm going to turn off my camera and step away for a second while you uh, address that question from Jonathan because... I don't know what's happened to me. I was feeling, my throat was feeling fine a few minutes ago. We came on the air and all of a sudden I've got this raw feeling in my throat and I'm having a real hard time here. So uh, let me go fill up my my water cup here and I'll be right back with you while you uh, turn your attention to, uh, to this to this question, sir. Well, sometimes people say more than the Bible says. Uh, if the emphasis of his lesson is that we have chosen to uh, uh, sort of ignore God's will for our lives. That sounds like it has it that has it has within it the concept of a predestination for our lives. And so if that's the emphasis um, that he is making and the application that he is making of those verses in the Matthew chapter six, he is stating more than the text says. Now, what is God's will for our lives? Matthew chapter six, here it is. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things shall be added unto you. That is his will for our lives. It is not some master plan that is involved in our life. It is just what allows a child to uh, to go to sleep at night knowing that mom and dad are in the, in the next room, that even if monsters came and attacked him in his room, all he'd have to do at 2.30 a.m. is jump out of his bed and run into the next room and jump in the middle of the bed with his mama and daddy, and there's no room for monsters in that bed. That is understanding the fact that God is our father and he loves us. And so as one begins looking at this, we need to understand there is no master plan. And so we're anxious because I don't know, uh, should I do this or should I do that or, or what else? Now then, what's his plan for us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so there is a truth in the aspect of what he says that anxiety comes whenever we lose sight of the promises of God. And we've got to keep that in mind. But when he makes the application that it is that uh, we, we are ignoring the plan, the will that God has for, her, for our lives, uh, you know, I'd like to hear that man and, and ask him in a discussion, what do you mean? by God's plan for the will of our lives. The will of our lives is for him to be with us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so you've got, that's his will for our lives. And you need to understand that the anxiety that is spoken of in Matthew chapter six has to do with the fact that uh, Food, it has to do with food and raiment. There's a verse in Psalms. I forget exactly where it is. I know where it is on the page in my Bible that says, I was a young man. David says, I'm now an old man. And I've never seen his seed forsaken or his seed begging bread. God's going to take care of us. And that's what the entirety of Matthew chapter six is all about. Look at the birds. They don't sow. They don't reap. What do we do? We've got to have our job. We got, we got to go out and work and work and work. And he says, you know, look at the birds. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns. And yet your father feeds them. 
Are you not much better than the birds? God's plan for our life is for him to take care of us. But it's not some master plan that uh, is indicated by the application that the, uh, the individual you're talking about, a master plan for the will of our lives. And so I'm, I, I'm, God wanted me to go this way, wanted me to go down the road to the right. And I went the road to the left and I'm filled with anxiety trying to figure out should I have gone right or left. That's not the master plan. The master plan is for he to love us and as his children and to love all of his children and never forsake them. Now then, anxiety in relationship to the context of Matthew chapter 6 is ignoring that plan that God has for our lives. And that is the anxiety about the fundamental things of our lives, and that is food and clothing, you know. Uh, and so he, uh, he looks at the lilies of the valley. They sow not, or pardon me, the lilies of the valley. They're in the field today, and tomorrow they're cast into the oven and burned. If God, so I tell you, if Sol Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these, God's going to take care of you. He may not give you the king's robe, but go out and look at the birds and look at the flower and seeing God taking care of birds are not too spare a soul for a farthing. And is not a flower blooms one day and dies the next. And yet look at the devotion and the care he gives for them. Now then, he says to us, don't you worry about it. And in this day and age, when there's a lot of anxiety about the cost of living and the anxiety about, will I, will I have my job and things of this nature? You know, seek ye first the kingdom of God as kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So that's the anxiety and anxiety is relative. I mean, uh, uh, what was it? The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. How do you, how do I deal with anxiety? But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. When I'm filled with anxiety, not just about food and raiment, but about anything about the, about failing health, about, uh, uh, you know, the sickness of some loved ones. Don't worry about it. Why? God knows you have need of these things. And so he says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And the result of that is, and the peace of God, peace is the opposite of that matter of anxiety. And it's a peace that passes understanding. The more I think about that, I'm confident that it passes our ability to comprehend. You know, it passes not just the understanding of own lookers on the outside looking at us when we're dealing with anxiety, like the death of a loved one or something like that. It's even a piece that, that we do not understand. It's beyond the ability of the comprehension, evidently, of any man on this earth. And that piece, the Greek says, will guide your life. I love that guide of your life. Feel with anxiety? Yes. How am I going to handle this? Well, I love that secular expression, turn it over to God. I love better the expression, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Those things that we have anxiety about, just trust God and let him work it out. And then read the entirety of the Bible and see how God worked things out so his will might be accomplished for mankind. Yeah, I think that's, um, it's important when you're talking about anxiety or worry or those kind of things to uh, make sure you separate the things that God has promised from the things that God has not promised. Um, you know, for example, God has promised to forgive your sin. God has promised um, that he will be with you in, 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 in every time, you know, Hebrews 13 and so on. Um, but God has not promised to uh, pay your mortgage um, or pay your rent. And if you have lost your job and rent is coming due, that, that that's probably a time to 
be a little bit anxious because that anxiety, hopefully, <clears throat> will spur you to do the things you need to do to fix the problem. That's right. Um, and even on that on that matter, even though God has not promised to pay your rent, if you will listen to his word about, you know, take the book of Proverbs, for example, dealing with being industrious, uh, working, um, and how to handle money properly, all, all, all those things are contained in Proverbs and other places. If we as God's people will listen to God's word on those matters, we greatly increase the chance that we're going to be able to pay the rent every month, pay the mortgage every month. Um, and so God has provided us a way to handle those problems if we will listen to him. But uh, there is a distinct difference. Sometimes preachers just say, I think you said this early in the question before I um, went to go fill up my cup. Uh, but but sometimes we as Christians or preachers just say, you know, worry or as, as the question says, anxiety is sinful. Well, OK, I understand what you're saying. And I appreciate the, the, the idea that you're wanting to put confidence in God and so on. But that's not the entirety of the picture. The answer is a little bit more complex. And to me, at least the fundamental a distinction that needs to be drawn is in between the things that God has actually promised that we don't should we should never have anxiety about versus the things that he has not promised and that we are responsible for in which case then we need to find biblical principles and apply them to those situations but then we also need to get busy and fix them handle those situations on our own uh obviously praying to God for his blessings as we do it but taking a personal responsibility for handling the problems that we need to handle instead of sitting passively back and worrying about them. So to, uh, that, to me, that's a very important distinction to make. And Jonathan, look again at that passage in Matthew 6. It's about tomorrow. You know, mm -hmm. what shall we eat on the morrow, on the morrow, on the morrow? And the last verse, after saying in verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of, of heaven, kingdom uh, kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The next verse says sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Let me, let me see if I can simplify it. There are those who I love so dearly who are away from the Lord. And I think about them every day of my life more than once every day in my life. I think about them. What do I do about it? Well, I'm just going to worry myself sick about it. No, I do what I can do today to impact the lives of those individuals that I love so much. They've got their own will. I cannot force them to, uh, to do right. And, and I'm helpless in relationship, but is there something I can do, something I can say, some action I can take? And when I have done everything I can do today to fix it, then forget it. How do you forget it? You give it to God, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. And when I've done everything I can do today to, to solve the what's happening in my life, then go ahead and live the rest of today. Some people live in the past and tragically far too many live in tomorrow, worrying about tomorrow. Take no thought for the tomorrow saying, what shall we do or what shall we drink? After all these things do the pagans seek. You know what you're like? You're like that individual who, uh, uh, who doesn't have a God any different from the God of stone and the God of wood. There's a living God and his promises are to us are to, uh, uh, to be with us. And that's all that, that's all I need. And so I cast my cares upon him. There's a preacher story. And let me go ahead and tell it because many young people have not heard these old preacher stories. Those who are <laughs> your age, Jonathan, have heard it several times and probably a lot of folks are, are knowing about this, but a man was uh, carrying down the walk down the road, carrying a heavy, heavy sack, had all kinds of things inside of it. What was in it is immaterial other than the fact that it was really heavy. And he was struggling, man. He could barely carry it. And a man came by in a, in a horse and buggy. 
And uh, he, he offered for the guy who had this act to ride with him. And as they were riding down the road and they finally got to their destination, the man uh, who had the load uh, got off the, the, uh, uh, the wagon with his sack. And he said, I just appreciate all that you've done. I appreciate it. All that, the, all that the mule has done, all that the horse has done, but I didn't want him to care, care the whole load. So when I got in the wagon, I kept hanging on to it over my own shoulder. He never turned the sack loose. So live today, enjoy today, get out and, and, and be, uh, be in the lives of others depressed today, go out and try to find somebody to help, make some phone calls, write some letters, get involved in the lives of others instead of sitting there worrying about tomorrow. If Jesus came back tonight, you wouldn't have to deal with tomorrow. So you need to keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a good point to make is that uh, take care of what needs to be taken care of today. Uh, Jesus does not say don't worry about today. Take care of what you need to take care of today. And if you have a longer term pro problem, there's probably something relating to that problem that you can take care of right now. So go ahead and take care of what needs to be taken care of today and let tomorrow worry about tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, do what you can today. Uh, but uh, thank you for that, sir. Um, I have uh, several, at least a couple of comments coming in to try and help me with my throat this morning. Uh, Travis recommends coffee. He says coffee will fix that uh, catch in your throat, Jonathan, um, and it will burn it right off. So start drinking coffee. You sound like Barry White. So if, <laughs> if, if, if I sound like Barry White, I'm sorry. I'm not fixing it. I'm going to let it stay. I'm just going to let that, that, that deep, grum, deep grumbly voice uh, uh, hang on there. Um, then um, uh, Teresa, so where Teresa's comment go? Uh, Teresa asked if we have had the vents cleared is, um, uh, have we had the vents cleaned in your office? Uh, st uh, uh, ironically, or whatever the proper word there would be, Teresa, uh, we are actually, the church here is getting quotes on cleaning the vents in the church building right now. So hasn't been done in the building's 40 years old, 40 years old. It may not have been done in 40 years, <laughs> but, um, it's, it's going to be done, uh, hopefully here very soon. I don't think that's the problem, Teresa. I actually have uh, another theory. Um, uh, I was here late last night because Tony needed my help running his program. And, of course, if you, you were there, uh, you saw me on the uh, program with Tony until 9, whatever o'clock we went off. I had a few things to do before I left. And so I was here at the office until 10. Uh, we are currently – staying with our, my daughter and her, her husband. Um, and they are very fastidious about locking their doors. And I don't have a key to the house yet. So I called her before I left the office and said, Amanda, I'll be there in about 30, 40 minutes. Make sure the door is unlocked for me. Um, I got to the house and the door was not unlocked for me. <laughs> now, <laughs> What I should have done is probably pounded on the door until everybody woke up and let me in. But she's got three kids and Manny leaves the house at like six, six o'clock in the morning uh, to uh, to go to work and all that kind of stuff. So I decided to be as magnanimous as I could be about that locked door. And I went back out to my truck and I laid the seat down and I went to sleep in my truck. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So I slept there until about 5.30 or so. And when I woke up, I said, you know, it's 5.30. Um, I've got to be on the air at 8. I'll just drive up here to the building anyway. And so I'm guessing that probably has something to do with the catch in my throat, that it might have something to do with having slept in the truck overnight in Manny and Amanda's <laughs> driveway and might have something to do with it. Next time, if that happens again, the kid, the grandkids are getting woken up. Julie's getting woken up. Everybody's waking up to let me in the house. That, I'm not doing that again. That one time that was it. <laughs> so, so there is no truth to the rumor that there was a drunk preacher in Melbourne last night who slept in his truck and he's got a hangover the next morning. Uh, no, John, no, no, do you no. have a hangover? Well, just yes or no. Do you have a hangover this morning? 
Uh, a hangover from sleeping in the truck. Yes, I absolutely have a hangover from sleeping in the truck. <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, but yeah, that that's the uh, that that's that that's the the story of my night. So it was not exactly what I had planned when I went back home. Um, anyway, let's <laughs> turn our attention to the next question. Um, Connie says, uh, "There's a verse that says God does not hear the prayer of a sinner, uh, but then we have the prayer of Cornelius. Uh, can you explain the difference in those uh, in those two uh, two thoughts, Dad?" Well, does God hear everything? You know, that's the question. Because what we're doing is that uh, we're we're uh, taking the word "hear" and defining it in various ways. That uh, you know, the Bible said, "He that uh, 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 rejects God, the proverb, even his prayers, an abomination to God." I don't know where that is in the proverbs, but it is there. He that turns his ways ear from hearing the law, even his prayers, an abomination to God. Well, how would God even know he was praying unless God was hearing everything that happens on this earth? And so we need to be very clear in relationship to how we use the word hear. Now, the word hear, uh, as used in the expression, God does not hear a sinner's prayer, uh, is, an, is takes the word hear and it's just totally redefined it. Is God aware of the fact that the sinner is praying? Yes, he's aware of every idle word. He's aware of absolutely everything. And so we've taken a word, defined it one way, and then redefined it in another way, and we've created a problem. Does God hear everything that happens on this earth? Well, yes. What about there's a verse that said God does not hear sinner's prayer? That um, is, um, is not a word spoken by the apostles. It was the conclusion that a man had reached. Where is that, 739 or is it 839? John 730, it's not 739. Um, uh, but it's, I think it's the blind man that Jesus had cured. That's, that's, in, uh, uh, that's in John chapter 8. And uh, so it's not, not 39. It's too far if it's in the... Uh, but the God does that, that's that's spoken by a man who's an uninspired individual. Now then, what about God answering the prayers of a sinner? Well, let me let me say it this way: God has not obligated Himself to answer the prayers of a sinner. Is God aware of the prayers that a man might be praying that says, "God, I'm trying to find the truth." God, please help me find righteousness and find your will. Absolutely. Does, does God answer that prayer? Yes, but not because he prayed that prayer, but because it's part of the nature of God. You know, you pray, Lord, please help the sun to come up this morning. Uh, a sinner prays, God, please help the sun come up this morning in the east and the sun comes up in the east, then God heard the sinner's prayer. No, no God, God works things on this earth according to his nature, and his nature is to have the sun uh, to come up in the east. I heard uh, some older preachers several years ago when I was a younger preacher talk about a brother out in California who was leading a public prayer and says, God said, we're thankful for the sun this morning that came up in the west. He said, the west? Well, yeah, God, we're thankful for the sun that came up in the West. And then he said, God, I don't know where the sun came up, but we, we are really thankful that the sun came up this morning, you know. Uh, and that happened in, in a church service. I, I'm telling you, I don't know why things are funnier when they happen in church, but there's just that added element that, that sometimes things happen that really, really get, get a hold of you. Now then, has God obligated himself? No. You know, there's not that obligation. If even if he prays it, uh, it is the nature of God that says that. And the man that says God does not hear sinners' prayer is talking far more than just the Lord being aware of words that an individual has said. He was talking about the fact that his eyes had been opened by Jesus. Uh, his argument that he has made. Uh, I think it's, I think I'm in the right one. God does not hear sinners prayer. And he said, 
Are you guys not aware since the creation of the world, nobody has ever opened in any blind man's eyes. He opened my eyes. You know who this guy is? He opened my eyes. And so when he said, God hears not sinners, any man is a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. Is, is there truth? Is it true? Any man is a worshiper of God. I'm talking about a Christian, a true worshiper of God, and does the will of God that God hears him? Absolutely. There's a truth that is in that. But see, our problem is we've taken a Bible expression, God does not hear sinners, and then we defined it in that way. Now then, let's get to the prayer of Cornelius. The prayer of Cornelius, God heard like God hears everything. What does God say about that prayer? Your prayers have come up as a memorial before God, as a reminder before God. And you've got to put that in respect to that because Cornelius, who was not a Christian, was praying and the will of God, and I'm talking about the eternal will of God of bringing in the Gentiles, was a reminder to God, not that God had forgotten about it, but was a reminder to God of all the promises that he had made throughout all of the Old Testament. And uh, those who are a part of this program, a part of digital Bible study, you guys really understand of how the Gentiles are mentioned over and over and over and over again, mentioned in places where we would not even think of it. When Jesus cleansed the temple, he said this house was intended to be a, a house of prayer for all nations, Gentiles. God's plan was not to have a court of the Gentiles. Solomon's uh, temple did not have a court of the Gentiles. That's only a New Testament thing that was put in there, uh, you know, by, evidently by Herod when he spent 46 years remodeling the temple. But there's one of those statements that's found. And throughout the Old Testament is the promise that the Gentiles will be brought up. And so the Lord says to Cornelius, your, pr your prayer's been heard. And it's come up as a memorial before God of his nature, it, it, it has to do with the memory of God and the memory of God was the inclusion. And so if, if, in, if instead of just taking a simple phrase, God does not hear sinners prayer and then jerking it out of context, and I'm not accusing the person who asked that, uh, did that, but so many people do that, jerk it out of his context, this is it. No, you've got to, you've got to put it in the context who said it, what did he mean when he said what he said? And, uh, and, but you just take a, a particular phrase, a part of a verse. I remember in New Zealand, I'd only been in New Zealand perhaps for a week. And uh, it was with a, a New Zealander. He, he and I had gone down to the, to the marketplace and uh, he met his friend. They'd been in high school together and he introduced me and said, he's come here to preach. And he said, I just love hearing an American accent. Why don't you just talk? He said that to me. And I, I turned to my friend. I said, what shall I talk about? He said, why don't you talk about salvation? <laughs> and so I seized the moment to say, well, if you want to know about salvation, there's a verse that tells who will be saved. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Evidently, I hit a nerve in the, in the mind and the heart of that individual. He said, oh, no, oh, no, he says, you've got to punctuate that. He who believes, comma, and is baptized, comma, shall be saved. Now you take out the unnecessary parts in there between the commas, and you have God's truth. He who believes shall be saved. Well, I wasn't the smartest person on earth, but I said, let's just move the commas. He who, comma, believes and, comma, is baptized shall be saved. Take out the unnecessary part between the, between the commas, and it says, he who is baptized shall be saved. The trouble is, there are no commas in that verse. <laughs> it's a classic example 
of how he that he wanted that to be his verse, but it couldn't be his verse. And right. so to make it his verse, he he didn't tear a whole page out of the Bible. He just added two commas and said, you know, <laughs> and commas do not mark off unnecessary things. And you know, I mean, that's not mm-hmm. in the purpose of commas, but I thought it was so interesting. <laughs> and uh, I will never forget that incident because of, uh, just as a you know young missionary arriving on the field, will I even be able to do anything? And I met this, and 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 wow. uh, and, 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 and I don't I, I, not in a boastful way, though I feel like I'm boasting about it now. But uh, uh, but I'm just thankful that God gives clarity of mind to deal with these things. But take out the unnecessary parts between the commas, and so to take wow. out God does not hear sinners prayer. Universal, that's His nature. Well, what do you mean by that? You define it. Does God hear everything? Yes. Then God hears sinners prayer. Right. Why? Now then we've taken that and used the word hear in a different way. Uh, Cornelius' prayer was heard in what sense? Well, the specific biblical sense was it came up as a memorial before God. Um, since you're talking about how you punctuate sentences, you talked about old preacher stories and Melissa said, love old preacher stories. And so Melissa, we now, now we need to know, do you love preacher stories that are old or do you love stories that are told by old preachers? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I enjoy telling my story. So I love preacher stories told by, told by old (laughs) preachers today. Okay. No, but um, I'm telling you, those guys thought it through really, really something. I read a bulletin article the other day. You know, was, I think it's about the Holy Spirit. In fact, I pulled it out and saved it. I thought that is one of the most distinct articles I've ever seen about the Holy Spirit. And I pulled it out. I, I got to file that away. And then I looked to see who the author was. And it was written in 1929 and appeared in the Gospel Advocate in 1929. And the truth is so powerful, you know, uh, uh, what's that, uh, 93 years or what, what however it takes to get to 19, uh, to, to 2029, you know, it, uh, it, it, it's amazing. It's amazing how truth is of that nature. And those, well, illustrations, those illustrations that were the stories they told, where did that, you know, uh, there, there's so many of those stories. You know why it's still alive? Because it's still really descriptive and good, like, I didn't put, I didn't give the, didn't ask the mule to pull the whole weight. I held on to the bag. (laughs) That's pretty good. Uh, Let's move on to the next one here. Um, Joni asked a question. She says, uh, why do some baptizers, she says, I guess she means people performing the baptism, uh, raise one hand before they immerse. Is there a biblical reason for this? Uh, She says, I know about the holy hands verse, but since the baptizer, does not have to be quote unquote holy, just curious about the practice. Um, and uh, I, I know you've seen this, Dad, because I've seen it as well. Um, do you have any idea where that originates from? I, I, I don't. Uh, it, it does well, not originate from the biblical text, it, as far as I know. It, it was here when I got here. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. I have no idea where it came from. It could, it could have come out of the, the, the priest and some of his actions, and we're not going to do this, you know, as in the Catholic Church, but we're going to hold up our hands. To my knowledge, I have never held my hand up baptizing any individual. Uh, why? I don't understand why it is done. Now then, it does not have to do with holy hands, because then you'd have to lift up both hands. Right. So now you've the person, you know, is in the baptistry, you've turned him loose and yet you've got a hold of his hands and everything. So you can immerse him without his hands flying all over the baptistry and everything. You've got a hold of that. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't. And so they only lift it. It's always the right hand. It's never the left hand. I mean, you know, it may have been the left hand in some occasion, but I've never seen anybody lift the left hand. And, and I have no idea where it started. But since everybody did it, then it, then it just kept on. It's one of those traditions, and I it has I, it has nothing at all to do with any verse in the scripture. Do you think John, when he baptized Jesus, lifted up holy hands? 
What about that Michelangelo painting of John baptizing Jesus? I wonder if John, John, John has his hand held up in that painting. That would be an interesting thing to look at, to see if it goes all the way back to, to the time of the Renaissance. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea where it comes from either, other than probably the fact that it's always been done. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if it does go back sometime into Catholicism or something of that nature. Who knows? But uh, it, 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 as you said, uh, I, I don't know of any Bible verse that would indicate there's any um, reason to do it from a you know from a yes. biblical standpoint at all. So nothing yeah. wrong with it. If you want to baptize somebody, nothing wrong with it at all uh, until somebody perhaps tries to bind it or something of that nature. And 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 one other thing, there's nothing in the Bible about having to say anything. I find that I find that remark. You didn't say it right. Didn't say what right. You know, you didn't say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I baptize you in the name of Jesus. You know, well, you tell me that's wrong. Acts two thirty eight. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. You understand? There's nothing in the Bible about what you say. Well, Dan, why do you say anything? Because in a public prayer, I want people in the audience, especially visitors based upon the confession of your faith, not infant baptism with the, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation based upon the confession of your faith. I now baptize you. And then uh, whether I say in the name of the father, the son of the Holy spirit, I don't know which one I'm going to say when I start the sentence, you understand? <laughs> and, and I say for the remission of sins. Now, why else do I do it when there's no audience? as a reminder to the individual of what's about to happen. And so sometimes I'll get in the baptistry, if it's a private baptism, or even a public baptism, I said, when you get down in that baptistry, don't you think about the mechanics. Don't you think about the audience. You think about what's happening to you right now. You're about to have the blood of Jesus to wash away all your sins. And that's what I want them to be thinking about when I baptize them. That's that's all that matters. Not the audience, not the not what is said, not whether it's the left hand or the right hand or both hands or no hands. Uh, that the, you know, but it was here when I got here, and uh, I do remember the first time I baptized somebody. I may have raised my hand. Uh, I was 16 years of age, preaching preaching outside of Huntsville at Harvest, Alabama. Had no baptistry there, as I recall, and a lady wanted to be baptized. So uh, I took to a nearby church that had a baptistry, put on those big wading boots. And when I put her under the water, I weighed 120 something pounds. When I put her under the water, those boots gaped out in front of me like I was a pregnant preacher. And, and the water came rushing down inside those boots. I came out of the baptist knee deep in water. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so uh, I, I remember the wet, I remember my, my wet shoes or my wet socks and everything's far more than I remember what I held my hand up. <laughs> I might've done it when I'm 16 years of age. So when I say I never did it, I have no remembrance of ever holding up my hand when I was baptizing somebody. Well, yeah. So as far as I know, there's a, uh, uh, no, um, um, you know, biblical precedent for it, but yeah, obviously there's a practice there. And as I said, nothing, nothing wrong with it if somebody does it, but uh, certainly don't want to bind it up on anybody. Uh, well, number next, we're we have time. we're out of time, John. Let me mention one other thing I think it's important, and that is the confession that is made. I love the confessions that were made in Trinidad, they do it different from the way they do it, they're standing in the water. It's the, you know, it's the moonlight. It's nighttime. Uh, they may have the headlights of cars shining down on, on the water. It's at, at, the, at, the, at, at a bay, at a harbor that's there. And they said to that individual, the preacher said to him, before I baptize you, why don't you tell everybody what you believe about Jesus? Hmm. Sometimes that confession goes three or four or five minutes based upon the confession of your faith that Jesus is the son of God. I'm going to baptize you. We do not make a We do not give enough emphasis to the importance of that confession. 
And I love the way they do it in Trinidad. I don't know who started that in Trinidad, and I don't know if they still do. It's been a few years since I've been there, but I absolutely love it. I, I wish it were done in America. Our culture will not allow us to do it, so that's that's different. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, if do you have a couple more minutes, Dad? Oh, I've got I've, I've got all all the time. Okay, because um, I, I don't think my throat's going to handle. Uh, the second hour on my own. So I'll just, we got a couple more questions here. So let's just go ahead and um, deal with those questions. And when, when we catch up to the people, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up if you got a couple minutes. So um, Travis has got a question here about Ezekiel chapter one uh, and revelation. Uh, they speak of the glory of God and the four living creatures. There are some differences. He says in the appearance between the, the different books, uh, are these beings real? If not, what do they or their features represent? Well, Travis, you've asked a question. I will ask you a question. If you'll answer my question, then I'll answer yours. How's that sound? In chapter one, when he sees the glory of God, he sees a wheel inside of a wheel. What does that wheel represent? You've got to, you've got to understand it's a vision and, and, and if there is significance to the fact that the, the are four living creatures there and there are four living creatures in the book of revelation and the features, there are some differences between them. Uh, it is a vision. And so Ezekiel is describing a vision and, uh, I remember sitting with a guy in, in, in Birmingham, he was a druggie and he read Ezekiel chapter one and he came to me and he said, I believe this guy was on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's remarkable when you get to the end of chapter one, these, this, you've seen the picture of the glory of God. And so in the book of revelation, you don't have the wheel inside the wheel. You've got the four living creatures. Why are there four and not five or seven or nine? I'll tell you exactly why. Because he saw four. Yep. And, and what they look like. Well, in the book of Revelation, I can tell you exactly what they look like. What does that represent? How would I know that the fact that one had the, you know, was a, uh, had the face of a lion, the other had the face of a human, I can't remember the, 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 the other two faces that were there. Uh, why make them represent anything? Why not just stand back and look and see what he saw and then just stand in awe and imagine what it would be to see that? I doubt very seriously that John saw the four, the four uh, what, what those four creatures look like. Well, I wonder what that represents. Didn't represent anything. John is writing a story about what happened on Patmos, and a door was opened in heaven. When he gets up and the door opened in heaven, he sees these things that are happening there. Are, are there things that are important? Yes. Why? Because not in Ezekiel, but in, in Isaiah and in Revelation, living creatures around the throne of God are saying, Holy. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. Is that significant? Oh, my, my. It's significant. How do I know it? Because of the emphasis that the rest of the Bible places on this. And, uh, and, and you pick up the commentaries, and it's just fascinating to see what people come up with. It represents the four major apostles. I bet you didn't know there were four. I didn't it's know that. No, <laughs> Andrew, James, and John. You got to throw Andrew. Why? You need a fourth. You know, or it's it's a Peter, Andrew, James, and Paul. Well, which 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 animal looks like what? And individuals have you know, have done that. I remember at one time there was a commentary that was written, and they used to say the earth is made up of fire and wind and water and I can't remember what that other element was. Uh, that that uh, uh, all, all of the things in in ancient science with fire and water and the wind and something else. 
And there was a commentator that says, that's what it represents. How would you know that? You know, and so people take that and, and the mistake of the book of Revelation, I'm telling you, Revelation is easy to understand until you try to figure out the meaning of absolutely everything in that book. If the Bible does not give emphasis to it, why do I worry about it? Why will I not see it as a vision of a dragon that's oh, yeah. into heaven? Uh, you know, and it cast a third of the stars. Why not a fourth of the stars? Why not, uh, you know, oh, the, oh, the it's the Trinity. It's a third of the stars he cast out and he cast Jesus down to the earth and he became baby Jesus. I'm, I'm doing what people do when they come to the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. You know, and if there'd been a fourth of the stars, then he would have cast out one of the four major apostles down to this earth because James died early. You understand why people do this? John says, there's a door in heaven. And here is what I saw. And stand back and stand in awe of what John saw. And stand there and not try to make everything any have great significance. I know what's significant in what he saw, and that is that book that is in the right hand, not left hand. It's in the right hand of God. Is that significant? Yeah. How do I know? The next several chapters of the Revelation talk about that very book. And so instead of trying to figure out, do they have meaning about anything? Just, just stop where it stops, and 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 listen. Uh, 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 they may have meaning. You know, I, I don't know everything about this book, but uh, and there may be some place in the Bible that that the, there there's an emphasis on four things that fit all the qualities of what those animals in in the, in the vision look like. You know, uh, but I cannot, uh, I cannot, I cannot make it. I cannot make it happen if you understand, you know, it's, uh, and, and, and so uh, uh, it, it's similar. Both of them saw something in heaven. What Ezekiel saw was totally different from what uh, John saw on Patmos. John saw the throne, but God saw the one on the throne. God saw the conversation that went on. Who's worthy to open the book? Is that significant? Absolutely. Why? The Bible gives gives a credence and importance to the one who knows the future. It's an affirmation of the deity of Christ. No angel knew it. No, uh, and only the Lamb of God. Is that the fact he's called the Lamb of God significant? Yes. The Lion of God significant? Yes. Uh, and, and so when you read this, what does the Bible say about the things in, in, in Revelation 4 and 5? And whatever the Bible says about that, spend time studying those things, understanding about how those things are used, and uh, and and that's. But uh, Travis, that's a good question. I really, I really thank you for it because uh, it, it it makes me think in an area that that I may not have thought of. Maybe I need to sit down and put Ezekiel one on a on on a piece of paper and right under it put uh, Revelation chapter four and five about those living creatures and see what the similarities and the differences are. I've never done that. And as I'm glad that you've noticed their difference. I was aware of them, but, uh, but uh, not all of them, uh, you know, it's not that I know everything, but I know, I, I know I'm smart enough to read this book and to read it and try to get the flow of the book Four major enemies. They're destroyed. We win. That's the story of the book of Revelation. And it answers the question, you know, will you avenge our blood on this, on this, on, on this earth? And the end of the book, God has avenged you, uh, has avenged the blood of the prophets, of the apostles and prophets on that city. And so that, th those things are significant. And so as you read the book, just be content. I, I don't sometimes when I teach it, and I've done this on digital Bible study, I don't make reference to everything that was in it. I may say one looked like this and this and this and this, but I don't spend time speculating what it might be. Why? Because when you get to the end of it, get to the end of it, it's still damn speculation. And I don't want anyone to say, well, brother Dan thinks that man represents Jesus, you know, the man of God. Okay. 
I don't think he does, by the way. But you, but you, but you understand. And it, it does make what Brother Dan says about this. The text, what does the text say? And lock in on that and say, now it is interesting that over in the book of, and some Old Testament book, there's some light shed onto who these locusts might be when you get when you get over to, to the chapter where the bottomless pit is open and the locust comes out. Is that in the Bible? Oh yeah, go read Joel 2, Joel 1 and 2, and you'll have an understanding of it. But let the Bible explain and let the Bible make important the things that are important. Thanks for that, Dad. Um, got one more question here from Christine that we'll do with before we wrap it up for today. Um, and it I probably comes out of a discussion we had some yesterday. I don't know if you saw any of that program uh, yesterday or not, Dad. But um, uh, Christine is asking, can you define what a deaconess is? Um, and that comes from uh, uh, Travis actually asked a question um, about um, uh, 1 Timothy 3.11 and the wives, uh, as the translation goes, there in the middle of the qualification for deacons. Um, and he said that Brother Woods, in his questions and answers uh, book, said that that identified a special class of women servants in the church. Didn't call them deacon. This is, um, and I went through several things, Dad, about the the difference there, the the difference of the uh, that 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 uh, uh, the word for women there is just women. Um, you know, it's in the accusative, not the genitive. So it's you know not necessarily referring to, at least my thought is, it's not necessarily referring to the wives of the deacons. Um, and um, I, you know, the idea that perhaps even the word, the, and the women likewise, as the deacons likewise, back in verse 8, several thoughts there. Um, the end point that I came to was simply that um, I'm perfectly fine saying that there were a class of women in the church that needed to, um, or that, that, that served the church, Maybe in the waiting of the tables, Acts chapter 6. Maybe in the care for the widows, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, that served the church in a very special way that needed to be, you know, dignified, sober-minded, faithful in all things, and so on. Um, but the end point that I came to was that if that's true, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But they're still under the guidance of... First uh, Timothy three, which says they cannot be overseers, they can't be elders. They're still under the guidance of First Timothy chapter two, which says they cannot exercise uh, authority inside the church, and so on. So, if you want to call them deaconesses or whatever you want to call them, that's fine. I don't care about the you know the title that you provide these ladies. They still have to serve within the co constraints of the rest of what the scripture teaches. Um. And the, the, I guess the final point I made was along those lines of, you know, sometimes progressives want to find these deaconesses and then from that say, well, then, you know, if they, if they can be deacons, then elders, then preachers, and, and so on down the line. Um, and uh, another thought I blended in there in the conversation is that the word deacon, uh, even Ephesians chapter 4 says that... Um, uh, he set some to be in the church to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers and pastors and so on for the work of ministry, which is the work of deacon in, if I can turn that into a verb. Um, so it, even, even the apostles are referred to as deacons. It's just a generic word for service. So that, that's kind of the path I went down. That's a real quick summary of everything I did. I spent like an hour talking about. Um, but, um, uh, I guess I guess the question probably here relates to uh, you know the the generic term for service and and, and, and deaconing versus the specific um, qualifications of of a deacon and so on. You, you have any thoughts on all that? Well, <clears throat> it's it's an illustration of how we study the Bible. Here is the denomination Southern Baptist has deaconesses. Some of them, some of the Pentecostal groups. Have deaconesses. And so we take the world's view and make an office not based on the scriptures, but based on the, the, the uh, practices of in, in Christendom of uh, 
and they've got to have a term to describe that individual. And they've taken a word, a very, very common word, the word deacon, uh, taken a very common word, most often translated servant. They've taken a common word and redefined it, using it and making an office in the church of deaconesses. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem right there. The word deaconess is not found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You've got to understand that. That the word elder is there and the word deacon is there or the word bishop is there and the, uh, uh, and, and, and the word deacon is there repeatedly. You need to understand that, that even those are not office. In the Greek, the word office is not apply is not found in the best text. The man desires the office of a bishop. He desires a good work. Look at the the uh, Strong's and the and the translations or, or the other translation of Greek Greek manuscripts, and 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 it doesn't describe an office. It doesn't decide a uh, a flow chart of of, of uh, authority within the church. I mean. There's Jesus and right next to them are the elders and right next to them are the deacons and somewhere down there, you got to put in the song leader and you got to put in the, the guy who uh, asked everybody to serve at the table and you got to put in there women and their work is deaconesses and everything. The word deaconess is found in the Greek. How's it translated? The one time, the one time that I'm aware that is found is in Romans 16 and there's Phoebe. What, what, what was she doing? She was a great servant of the church and he acknowledges her. You know, Paul talked about my fellow prisoners. That's not an office. It is a description. And so here's Phoebe and she is the deaconess. What does that mean? Forget the denominational term. She's a servant S. Mm -hmm. It's all the word deacon is masculine and and to make a feminine out of it you put the s on it and in the greek the ending would be different to indicate it is female it does not say she is a deacon it uh, and it does not say she's a deaconess in the denominational structure it's not an office and so there are women in the church today who serve great, great purposes in the kingdom of God. Jonathan, you quoted 1 Corinthians 12, uh, apostles and prophets and teachers. And then all of a sudden he says, helps and governments. I've looked at those phrase and I thought, I'm not even sure what that is. I am not sure, but they understood in the first century that the Lord gave spiritual gifts to individuals so that they might supply what God had in mind, in mind for the church in that first century. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? No. Are all helps and governments? No. What are helps and governments? It was whatever was needed to have people who were qualified to fulfill their roles. It's a miraculous thing that was given. Now then, do we have helps and governments in the church? Absolutely. Somebody in the church there at Rockledge has got to call the AC people to arrange to get the, uh, 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 the, 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 the vents clean. Somebody's got to do that. What's that? He's a deacon in the church. Not capital D, he's a deacon of the church. Church secretary, if, if it were a church secretary in another church, she is serving the church. How can I describe it as a servant S, as a deacon S? It's not an office. It is a description of a work. And so to argue, well, did they have in the church a group they were called deaconesses? I think you'd struggle to try to figure that out. Were there women who served the church in various ways? Absolutely. Phoebe being a classic example of it. But mm. uh, Jonathan, I do not know 
uh, who teaches the three-year-olds and the church there in Rockledge. I do not know who uh, uh, who is so skilled in decorating room, de decorating classrooms, or decorating bulletin boards. I do not know who that person is, but whoever is doing that is a servant of the church. And if it is a woman who's more skilled at doing bulletin boards than most men that I know, if a man's doing it, he's a deaconess. If a woman's doing she, or if a man does it, he's a deacon. And if a woman does it, she's a deaconess. Why is she a deaconess? Because she's a woman. You cannot use the word deacon and apply it to a female. It's masculine. In the Greek, it is always masculine. You change the ending of the word, like in English, you put the E-S-S. -S. In Greek, you change the end of the word. And so a woman cannot be a deacon. Can she be a deaconess? Absolutely. Are the deaconesses in the church? Absolutely. Every church I know, every place I've ever worked, there are better deaconesses than there are deacons. Now, see, when I say deacon, you're thinking about the office of the deacon. And that's yep. as wrong as can be. Elders are deacons of the church. And we've got, we've got, to, uh, we've got to understand that, that elders are deacons in the church, not, yep. not the office. And the concept of the office of the deacon, we, we think of a flow chart of who's the closest and who's the closest. And, and it, it uh, you know, in this, in this flow chart of authority, that's not what it's all about. What is an apostle? He is one sent. What is a prophet? He's one who speaks. What's a teacher? He's one who teaches. You understand? Those are not offices. They're just words to describe the functioning nature of the church. So are the deaconesses in the Church of Christ? Absolutely. But don't take the denominational definition and bring it over. Just recognize it is the common word for servant. Jesus is called a servant. The apostles are called servants. And Phoebe is called a servant. But you can't call her a deacon. Why? Because she's not a man. So in that verse, she is the deaconess. And uh, I just think it is significant that there are few translations that even translate her deaconess. There's some who want to, and I think that's the outside influence of trying to make the Bible sort of fit into modern terminology. Uh, she is described as a servant of the church. Why? That's what the word deacon means, and, and the word servant is neither male nor female. It's the ending of it. The root word is exactly the same. Well, I, I, that's largely what I, what I, uh, how I answered that question. Excuse me, how I answered that question yesterday, and uh, that, that's largely the problem we have, is that um, we so try to codify, codify rather, uh, and and silo everything, and we, we've made religious titles out of these generic terms, and then try to fit our structure around those religious titles, and and I think that's what we do with the term deaconess is that we. We call somebody a deaconess, or then we, frankly, these days we just masculinize everything and just call it a, call the call her a deacon, um, and now we have some kind of church official, which is the the opposite, really, of what's being talked about here. Obviously, there are people who have roles in the church uh, in First Timothy three that need special qualifications, uh, maybe to handle more sensitive works or something of that nature. But the root, the root thought here is that these individuals are just servants. So um, I, I think you're you're um, um, hundred percent correct about that and all those things. So um, uh, that brings us up to speed, I think, with all the major questions that we have. Um, I'll give you a um, uh, last word here if you have anything else you want to talk about real quick, Dad, before we sign off. Well, I just enjoy these times together, and I love the fact that there all these questions are here. What it means, Jonathan, is that you've got an audience of people that are out there that are studying the Bible, thinking about the Bible, and uh, there are no bad Bible questions. You've got to understand that. The question that you think, well, that's too stupid for me to ask. Maybe you are dumb enough and brave enough to ask a stupid question that will help other people who are dumb and do not recognize it. You understand every, if somebody's mm -hmm. seeking truth, man, there, I don't care what the question is. 
go ahead and ask it because if it's something you're thinking about, something you've been studying about, let's see if we cannot help each other come to an understanding of the word of God. But I, I, I just stay excited every week, not knowing what questions are going to come up and they just keep coming up. And every one of them is just filled with depth and meaning and allows us to talk. And we could go three hours, you know, just, and, and the questions would still be coming in. Yep. Uh, the um, one exception to that is for Travis. Um, there are any number of uh, dumb questions that Travis could ask. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and wrap it up. Appreciate your dad coming on. Uh, as I said, everybody, I'll be on the road um, uh, starting tomorrow uh, and be gone. Um well, tomorrow, and then I'll be gone all of next week as well. So from the deep end, we'll not be airing uh, at all next week. And so I will see you back here for From the Deep End, Lord willing, on the, I think it's the 19th of September will be the next time that From the Deep End will air. Uh, and at that time, we will uh, finish up or pick up and hopefully finish rather quickly uh, our study of the book of First Peter. It's been a while since we've made it over to First Peter, but um, uh, appreciate you carrying most of the load. Uh, this morning, and my throat is feeling better than it was a few minutes ago, but uh, still a little bit raw. So uh, I do appreciate you handling most of those questions well, let, for me. Well, let me just say one other thing. Uh, Travis has just told us that the wheel represents a crimson tide. Uh, it, it makes me want to go study this wheel even further. Thank you, Travis. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw um, uh, Jonathan ask how how would how would Alabama do against Texas this weekend. And I'm predicting well. I think Alabama will do well against uh, uh, Texas this weekend. Um, I think unless people get hurt, I think Alabama is going to do pretty well against most people this year. And yes, yes, Jonathan, that includes Georgia. If y'all make it to the SEC championship game, um, so let, let's go ahead and sign it off. Uh, thank you again, Dad, for being on with us, and uh, we will see you back here, Lord willing. Uh, for the next episode of From the Deep End on the 19th of September. So um, have a good day, everybody, and we will see you. Uh, uh, see you. Well, see you when I get back from Florida or from Texas.